the Financial Survival Network. Now more than ever. And welcome. This is Financial Survival Network. I'm your host, Kerry Lutz. We have a very special guest for you today. The last time I had him on the show was 11 years ago. He had a best-selling book that's uh, been translated into 32 languages around the globe. Uh, name is Joe Navarro. Joe, former FBI agent. Um, that was quite a career in and of itself, but it looks like your career as an author, as a uh, motivational speaker, as a trainer, has far eclipsed what was an extraordinary career in the FBI. The book... Uh, that I first met you on, it was your first book back in 2012, was What Everybody Is Saying. I want to say personally that thank you for it. It has served me for the uh, 1099 that I paid for it. I believe I've gotten returns in the many, many thousands in interviews, on my podcast, in dealing with, with company CEOs and officials, sussing out what they're really saying rather than what I hear them saying. Uh, so that was great. And now uh, the latest book you did out uh, a while ago, Be Exceptional, Master the Five Traits That Set Extraordinary People Apart. So thank you for coming on the show. Uh, your first trait is self-mastery. Uh, yeah. Can you define that? What does that mean? Yeah, and, then, and Carrie, it's good to see you again. I, I've always enjoyed the the questions that you ask. I think you have one of the finest shows uh, programs out there because you you ask good questions. Mastery of self, you know, it, it, when I was in the bureau, I did thousands of interviews. In fact, uh, it's somewhere it's around thirteen thousand interviews, and it's too easy always to focus on the negative things. And so I, I looked back on those interviews and the people I've met over the years, and I looked at, well, what were the positive attributes? And one of the things that I found was that exceptional individuals really have mastery over themselves. They, they have the capacity to fulfill obligations. They have the, the ability to focus on what they need to focus on. They uh, they're conscientious um, and they have the ability to moderate their emotions so that they're not out of uh, not out of control. And of course, uh, you know, within reason, um, they don't do things that get them in trouble with uh, drugs or alcohol or uh, or or the law and so forth. And just looking back throughout history and you think, well, what would be an example in history? And, and you look at um, Leonardo da Vinci and you think, oh, the most valuable painting in the world was painted by his man, by this man. But he had no mastery over himself. In fact, he was looking anywhere from eight to 11 lawsuits during his life for failure to complete uh, jobs that he had been paid for. We call that felony. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so I was looking at that and, and sometimes because of, you know, who they are, we think, oh, they were exceptional. No doubt. Nobody painted uh, like, like he did, but the man did not have mastery over his life. In fact, he was always on the run because someone was always uh, after him. And and I think this is something that, um, you know, you and I were talking uh, earlier, that introspection, being able to look at our lives, being honest with ourselves, because that is so hard to be honest and say, you know what, I don't do this very well, or I'm failing here, or, you know, I'm going from my 30s to my 40s, and, and am I still the same person? Have I not changed? I think that honesty has to 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 kick in, and I think exceptional individuals, um, you know, harness everything that they can, even if it's not perfect. But they have and they exercise mastery over their own lives. I think that's a great point. Uh, two things come to mind. Number one is uh, there's a book by a guy named Scott Adams talking about failing your way to success. So. Self-mastery means learning from failure, not being defeated by it, right? 
Uh, absolutely. We, <laughs> that's how we learn to use computers. Um, it, you know, everyone I talked to, which, which, uh, it was everything from farmers to day laborers to, uh, uh, physicians, um, they took whatever circumstances they had and whatever failure they had. And they said, failure is not going to define me. What's going to define me? They didn't put it this way, but I discerned this from them. What's going to define me is what I do each day in furtherance of where I want to go and what I want to be. A young young man I, I, I talked to, he, he said he was so poor that everything they read, uh, or he and his uh, siblings read, they got from garbage cans. And, you know, you could sit there and, 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 and take pity on that. And they said, please don't. I got a lot of reading done. People throw up a lot of stuff. He was defining his life by where he was headed. He knew he had to be uh, uh, to educate himself. And so he created the architecture, which a lot of people don't do. They expect they outsource everything. Oh, school will teach me everything I need to know. No, it won't. <laughs> Uh, one book will not teach you everything you need to know. They they apprentice themselves. They create an apprenticeship for themselves. I, I was talking to this, this young man, and he says, I scavenged for books. I asked people for books, any book. And he created his own learning program. And, uh, and I think that's what sets extraordinary people uh, uh, apart. That is mastery of self. What we often see is people say, well, I'm overwhelmed by life and everything that has gone against me. And uh, and, and I listen, I understand my 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 family was poor. We live my my mother lived on tips, people living, leaving 15 cents on the table. So I understand poverty. But it's what you do with that. And and the the concept of or the construct of I don't care what life presents, I'm going to go the other way. I'm going to create the architecture to go in, in the other direction. And that's what really sets exceptional people apart. All right. So I remember a former Speaker of the House, John Boehner, said, I have to deal with every son of a bitch who walks through the door, whether I like him or not whether I want what he wants or not, I got to deal with them. And isn't that really an encapsulation, a summation of life? You got to deal with these people. A lot of them you don't like, a lot of them you like, hey, you're in the federal bureaucracy. There's right. superiors who you just want to punch out because you they just really, but then you realize I have to make this work. I can't just right. act out on emotion. I've got to communicate, which is communicate, build a bridge, and get to where, take that bridge where I want to go. But isn't that like the most difficult thing when you're dealing with people? A lot of them, person, we seem to be in a society dominated by personality disorders, and we got to deal with these people on our day-to-day -day life. Yeah. What can you tell us how we do this more effectively, Joe? Yeah, and you bring up a great point. You know, what... <laughs> When 4% of the population is antisocial, at least 1% is psychopath, and anywhere from 2 to 8% of certain uh, occupations uh, have, uh, are, are, are just filled with uh, narcissistic uh, personality, including, as you say, in, in, in politics, you, you never know what's going to come through the door. But I can tell you this, if you don't have mastery over yourself, then whatever comes through that door, you're not going to be able to deal with it because the easiest thing for humans to do is go emotional. And that's what often happens. Hey, how did this get out of, uh, out of control? Well, somebody had to be the adult in the room. Somebody had to control their emotions and someone didn't. Um, and that is a very difficult uh, thing to, to, to get across if you don't begin to practice that at, at an early age. If, if you grow up with a belief system that if they're angry, then I have to be angry. Otherwise, I'm perceived as weak. 
you're you're going to have problems all your life because the the most exceptional people that that I dealt with learned to observe that things were getting out of control or that this person has problems or they come in with emotional luggage, as I'm sure Speaker Boehner faced all the time. And the question is, how do we move forward? Because, you know, there are many ways to de-escalate. You can do it with distance. You can do it by angling your body so that you're not as intense in somebody's face um, by lowering your voice speaking with cadence, tilting your head, these things de-escalate and it's up to you. And you see, and, and, and I do these things all the time. I don't see it as weakness. In fact, I see it as power because by me being in control of my nonverbals, including my voice, I'm actually in a way controlling them because I can literally see them calming down. How can I help you? First of all, what is your name? All right, have a seat. You know, all the things that uh, you learned in what everybody is saying and in Be Exceptional, it's about being able to observe these things and then using the mastery over yourself so that then you can exert influence on others. And you and you have to realize that this is not a losing proposition, that by me being in control, I'm exercising dominance. The minute I go emotional, it's over. Because once the emotional brain kicks in, right, this is the subcortical area of the brain. We have the, the neocortex, the outer area that thinks, the executive brain. The more primitive area, the limbic system is all emotions. And if you're doing everything there, then it's just about physicality, pushing your chest out, you know, breathing heavy and so forth. And you're, you're, you're out of control. So the exceptional individual learns to control themselves, knowing that by how I look at you, the angles, the distance, the breathing, I can actually begin to get you to change. That's, that's not just influence, that's power. For sure. And it makes me think about the media, because the media in general, they're just pot stirrers. They want to shift you to that reptilian emotional brain, because then you accept information uncritically and you just believe whatever they tell you because, hey, when you see a kid uh, in a horrible situation, it immediately shifts you into that primitive brain emotional state. And then you just, once your critical mind shuts off, they own you. And, you know, it's so hard to do that. I've just stopped watching news for the most part because I felt like I can't control it, you know watching like the World Trade Center come down still affects me very deeply. And I have to be careful when I get into that emotionally charged state, because that's when, for me, I make mistakes. When I'm in that in that right. state, I'll believe things that people tell me because I want to believe them, not because I've proven it true to myself. Right. And 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 that's part of what you said earlier. It's that self honesty. I, I know the things that trigger me. I've been to I've been to too many autopsies. I've been at, at too many autops, uh, autopsies where there were children. To this day, forty years later, I'm still affected by those autopsies. The 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 little broken hands at in the Oklahoma building. The 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 baby that was. Uh, um, Well, in in Yuma, Arizona, in 1979, I cannot get that out of my head. And I have to be careful. As you say, you have to be careful with emotions. This is why mastery is so important. Because, you know, I tell people, I give people the example. Think of how many times you've been in an argument. And then an hour later, you think of all the clever lines you should have said. And the reason you didn't think of those clever lines in the moment is because you went emotional. You went emotional. 
it's only when we are cognitive, when we're in the thinking mode and emotions are aside that we think of all those Churchillian things that we could have said, uh, which reminds me of when Churchill, uh, somebody said uh, to Churchill, sir, if you were my husband, I'd feed you poison. And and he retorted as only he, uh, he can. And madam, if you were my wife, I'd drink it. Uh, you can only think of those things when your your mind is, is is clear but yeah we have to be careful not to be driven to the emotional side we have to be able to 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 think through things all right so to get into a little touchy subject so men and women are different regardless of what the media might be telling us now there are yeah. distinct differences between the sexes and one is female operating system is based on emotion and experiential more so than men. Not that women can't be rational. I'm not <laughs> saying that at all. But um, in dealing in these interpersonal relationships, men are coming at it often from a logical standpoint, women mm -hmm. from an emotional standpoint. What I'm saying is that, that this is the crux of all the problems that we have in society today, uh, a lot of what you're saying there. Well, let me answer it this way, because I've I've looked at the literature, and we what we know is this: our our brains are not necessarily all wired the same way. We know that uh, in in women, there the the connections between the the right and the left side of the brain. They're more in connect, interconnected, uh, men uh, uh, less so. Um, we're barely now starting to understand the brain. We know that the, the times while we're growing up where testosterone is sort of is infused into us at, at, at different intervals, and even estrogen is infused at different intervals. Uh, begins to shape us. Um, there are internal uh, uh, differences, and of course, there are the 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 external ones. I think the biggest mistake that we make, and and I tell this to everybody, and it has nothing to do with whether you're a man or a woman. It is the failure to understand, or or the failure to think that you talk to everybody the same way and that everybody responds should respond the same way. And I wish universities at a minimum and schools maximum would begin to teach that just as you and I, um, carry find our own way of communicating with each other and of, for instance, something as simple as turn yielding, our agreement behaviors, realize that every single person on this planet we should address differently because we all, some people think very fast, some people are slower, some people are more pensive, some people are emotional. We may not know why, why uh, they're emotional, uh, nor must we sit there in judgment over that. The fact of the matter is, and I've been, I was in a room with, with about 76 other FBI agents, and we had just come back from the Murrah building, and on the wall, on the wall were little hands that had been drawn by local children, and every single man that was there was in tears. Mm. So I don't want to hear about, well, some people are more emotional than others. Let me tell you something. If it's emotional enough, right, unless you're a psychopath, you're going to cry. All these men that were there, I, 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 I don't remember I, uh, uh, any, any uh, women at, in, in, on that particular day, although there were many there. We were all crying just because of, of the imagery. What's important is, because I may be in a position to be working both with both uh, men and, and women, is what are the specific needs, wants, desires, and preferences of each individual? When I hold, when I hold my training, and I, we do training uh, around the world, and, and in fact, 
um, we're, we've got one coming up in, in Amsterdam in June. I say, what do we use nonverbals for? It's not to detect deception. It's to assess individuals for their needs, their wants, their desires, their preferences. And if you get this one right, you're going to win. Their fears. What do they fear? You as an investor, what do you fear? Uh, I'm going to get the, the... Losing money. <laughs> losing money, right? We don't say I fear it. You know, oh, I do. do do I'm doing the due diligence because I don't want that to happen. But the brain works on fear. And if you can do that for every person, if you can figure out, well, what are their preferences for talking to each other? I, I think we're we're better ahead. I, I think uh, to a certain extent, the media and society wants to park us into these the silos of men, women, alternates, this, Boy Scouts, this, no, uh, the Mormons are over here. And, uh, you know, it's, it's like, stop, stop. We're one species, but it, but we need to be individuated because we all have preferences. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. It's these pre-programmed responses where, you know, you shoot the messenger without listening yeah. to the message. You immediately discount the message because you don't like the messenger. And when you were talking yeah. before, you get into an argument and then a, an hour later you realize you were wrong. And why didn't I realize right. I was wrong then? And the emotions, yeah. when they kick in, they're so powerful and they're always there, right? Just waiting to come to the surface. Yeah, yeah, it's um, and, and, and that's part of it. And, you know, th there's so much good advice out there about dealing with with uh, emotions and so forth. And, uh, you know, e even pr programs like yours where, you know, there's a lot of things I don't know about business, but you can create your own learning experience uh, so much easier now than in the 60s and the 70s and, and, and in the 80s. So really there there's no excuse i mean you you you've had the uh, uh, world class uh, speakers on, on your program um you know i don't have time to travel around the country to catch these folks <laughs> uh, so it, it, there really is no excuse for not working on mastery of of uh, of self yeah. so it really should be you should be a lifelong learner and you're never fully the master of yourself so no. it's a lifelong occupation if you will and it's the most important one i think because it's going to uh, determine your success in life your success in relationships and you know so many times you say something and because you're in that emotionally charged state and you can't take it back and then the wreckage uh, follows yeah and once it's out it, it it doesn't go back no yeah. so so you're doing uh these boot camps on uh communication you know i, I just have a joke for you you know mm -hmm. they say that uh 80 of all com communication is nonverbal. but me and my ex we had that beat a hundred percent of ours was not <laughs> we just stopped talking <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> that applies to a lot of lives that i know uh, <laughs> Gary, um, you know, over the years, I've been asked that question. What What's the number? Uh, what exactly is the number of how important body language is? I, I can tell you this. It is the principal means by which we humans communicate. It is the best way that we communicate empathy. It is the way that we assess for our mates, whether we play with them for 10 minutes or we marry them, we do this non-verbally. It's how we assess for danger and safety. And um, it certainly uh, assists us in, in socializing. So when people say, well, so what percentage is that? I say it, it really depends on where you're at. You could be staring at a loved one and, uh, you know, and it's 100 percent. 
or maybe down to 60% in a, in a business meeting. But it's never much lower than that because I've sat in mis- business meetings where we were talking numbers and we were all kind of reading each other the way we were saying the information, uh, what our attitude was, how confident we were. And, the, you know, all of that was uh, was nonverbal. So um, it's an important part of our lives. And um, and and I would just caution everybody, stop looking for deception. It's useful to look for issues, right? Look for psychological discomfort, as I teach in my books, but uh, and use it to communicate effectively. Right. Couldn't agree more. Hey, Joe, where is the best place to find you these days? All your books, obviously, on Amazon. That's where I purchased them. But the uh, website, which one's the best to find? You? Yeah, my website, if you go to joenavarro.net, uh, everything is there. Um, and, uh, I've got my books, uh, articles, uh, psychology today and, uh, and this wonderful event that we're going to be doing. It, it's a, a two days of intense training in, uh, in Amsterdam. Um, it's, uh, one of my favorite cities and we really do a deep dive into how we use nonverbals and, uh, and I, I I tell folks, especially in the you know most of the people that I work with are in the financial sector. the The most important thing that we can do is to try to understand the other person, communicate with them effectively, but also is what messages are we sending? Are we are we sending messages that, um, you know, sometimes we come across as a, a little too playful, maybe crass, maybe narcissistic, uh, whatever, is we have a role to play. And what messages am I sending when I sit there in a meeting and so forth? And um, so we explore that, uh, the, those those kinds of things, because it's not just about reading others. Always remember, everybody else is reading you. And the question is, what message are they getting? Do they see you as competent? Do they see you as uh, uh, with with, with uh, hesitation? Um, do they see you equivocating? Do you have to bite your lip and and pull on your shirt collar to answer a simple question? Um, delays in answering a uh, throat clearing. I remember uh, Bob Gates when who was uh, 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 I think he, for a while there he was the CIA. Then he was at the right. Pentagon, and uh, he, obviously the media would ask him questions he wasn't allowed to answer. And he always cleared his throat when he was going to have to bamboozle us. He, <clears throat> <laughs> if you got to clear your throat to answer a question. I want to ask more questions. Uh, that's that's <laughs> why the are you clearing your throat? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Hey, well, if you got a question for Joe, shoot me an email, kl at carrylutz.com, and we'll get you an answer. And the link uh, to Joe's website is in the show notes of this interview. All the books are available on Amazon or wherever fine books used to be sold. And Joe, really appreciate you coming on spending uh, time with us and we really appreciate it and we will talk to you again soon that's great thank you for having me carrie and let's not wait 11 more years huh definitely